Good job. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with the, me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, and uh, we're going to have a, a wonderful time tonight looking at an interesting subject, and the message tonight is uh, called Replacement Theology. And a replacement theology is bad theology. And uh, you might not even know what replacement th theology is, but after tonight, I believe you'll have a good understanding of what it is and the dangers of it. And uh, it begins here in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, I know already some of you are yawning. It's going to be exciting, though. Uh, I think you'll get done with this sermon and said, man, I learned something. This is interesting, but replacement theology is bad theology. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, if you'll stand with me. Uh, we're going to read two verses, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, and we'll read those together in unison. Ready? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And uh, that first part, 70 weeks, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And, uh, well, like I said, you might not even understand or know what replacement theology is, but replacement theology is bad theology, and uh, I believe you're going to have some understanding in, in that tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we need you. And uh, all over uh, the world, people are teaching and expounding a theology called replacement theology. And uh, it is even infiltrated into some good Bible-believing churches and good Bible-believing people. I pray that you help us as Bible believers remember that the Bible is our final authority. Help us to have some understanding tonight, clarity tonight, bless tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last week we heard that uh, the president declared Jerusalem uh, to be the capital of Israel, amen. amen. And oh, there was a buzz all around that, oh, Jerusalem is the capital. Yes, I agree. We're excited as Christians, mainly because we understand Bible prophecy. And Israel has a lot to do with the end time Bible prophecy. But there is a teaching, a teaching that's been around for a long time, a teaching that says the church has replaced Israel. It's commonly known as replacement theology, and it's basic teaching. It teaches that the Jewish people are no longer God's chosen people. Uh, they, in fact, are no different than any other people group. They're no different than the Chinese, Spanish, or even uh, South Africans. And it, it, it continues its teaching with the thought that God has no plan for the Jews apart from the new birth or born-again experience. By the way, the Jews need to be born again. Uh, they need that new birth. They need to be uh, trust Jesus Christ as their Savior to go to heaven. Amen. But the teaching of replacement uh, theology also states that the term Israel, as found in the Bible today, uh, this, uh, the nation of Israel, the term Israel has been replaced by the church. And so after the day of Pentecost, Israel is the church. Israel is the church. Replacement theology, the doctrine, will also tell its followers that the promises or covenants that were given to Abraham, the blessings that were ascribed to the nation of Israel in the Bible are no longer valid. Uh, they are now actually, they'll say, given to the church. Those Bible promises, those covenants that were given to Israel, they no longer apply to the Jewish people. They apply to the church. And they then go on to say that the blessing that the Jews uh, used to have, or they're, it's no longer valid. They're now under a curse as a result of the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Replacement theology is prominent in many Christian circles worldwide. Uh, movies are made, uh, books are written, conferences are held. Uh, spending much time, effort, and energy under the false banner that God has replaced Israel with His church. Now, it might not mean much to you, but by the end of this sermon, I think you're going to realize, wow, 
Uh, I didn't even know that, but it's there, and it affects many, many different people. And a brief history of replacement uh, theology is probably needed by all of us, but a little brief history. Think back with me to the first century. The church was well-connected to its Jewish roots, and think with me for a minute about each of the 12 disciples. Uh, they were all Jewish. Uh, Peter was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. Even young Timothy, that young disciple of Paul, was half Jew half Gentile, half Greek, you might say. There was such a, a tie to the Jewish people, and, and Jesus intended it to be this way. Jesus was a Jew, and the basis of his teaching were on the Jewish scriptures. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now the problem, the Jewish religion did, did not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And this began to cause some natural problems in the Jewish-Christian relationship. And we read about it in the Bible. And, and to start with, the problem was one-sided. The problem was with the Jews. Do you remember in the Bible, Romans chapter 10 is a good example. Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be what? Oh, Paul looked at the Jewish people, the children of Israel, and he had a, a burning heart for them. He was a Jew, and he said, boy, I desire them for the, to realize that they need to be saved. Boy, they, it was one-sided. The Jews, on the other hand, had a problem. Acts chapter 7, verse 59, and they, the Jews, stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The Jews began to persecute Christian. As Christianity began to spread in Jerusalem, the Jews looked at it as a, a hindrance to the Jewish uh, thoughts, and they began to take up and, and throw actual stones and physically hurt Christians. But it was one-sided. The Christians never persecuted the Jews. It was the Jews persecuting the Christians. Acts chapter 14 uh, throws a little bit more light on that. In chapter 14, verse 19, And they came thither, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch, and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. The persecution was Jews to the Christians. They, they didn't realize that Jesus was the Messiah, and there were Jewish people that were getting saved, and this caused uh, some conflicts in the synagogues in Jerusalem, and all Christianity uh, began to quickly spread as Paul went on his missionary journeys. Both Jews and Gentiles were gloriously saved. Amen. The leaders of the early church, all Jews, by the way, uh, at one time saved Jews, Christian Jews, uh, but this began to change as things went on. As the years began to pass away, soon the church leaders were made up of mostly Gentiles. Uh, about 66 AD, the Jewish uprising in Israel led to Titus coming, the uh, Roman general Titus coming to Jerusalem, destroying all of Jerusalem, breaking down the Jewish temple, Herod's temple, and many Gentile Christians interpreted the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem as a sign that, that God had abandoned the Jews. They didn't interpret that. They said, ah, God's abandoned his people. By the way, could God, uh, allowing the destruction of the temple, be that he was showing us that temple worship was no longer necessary? Right. Remember, the Holy Ghost now resides in us. Uh, not in the Holy of Holies, but down inside of our hearts. Amen? And we go a little bit further. As the church spread far and wide within the Roman Empire, and its membership grew increasingly non-Jewish, Christianity and Judaism began to take separate paths, and, and far, their differences became farther and farther, wider and wider, and different and different. The early church fathers began to show a relation uh, that the relationship was deteriorating. You read a lot about this, but let me do some quotes for you. For example, a uh, famous church father, church father, Justin Martyr, A.D. 160, in speaking to a Jew, said, The scriptures are not yours, but ours. Uh, Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, in A.D. 177, declared, Jews are disinherited from the grace of God. Uh, Tertullian, uh, in A.D. 160, he lived to be 230, not 230, but to the year 230, amen? In his treaty, he said uh, he is against the Jews, and he had, uh, had announced that God had rejected the Jews in favor of the Christians. Uh, we continue on in the early 4th uh, century, Eurobias wrote that the promises of the Hebrew scriptures were for Christians and not the Jews. 
and the curses were for the Jews. You, you sort of understand, they, the, they were tightly knit. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. Uh, Paul went into the synagogues, preached to the Jews, encouraged the Jews, begged the Jews to get gloriously saved. Many did. But as time went by, rather than try to reach the Jews, Christians began to have struggles with the Jews, accused the Jews. There became a tension between Christians and Jews. A really big change occurred in AD 306. Constantine became the first quote-unquote Christian, uh, Christian Roman emperor. At first, he treated Jews and Christians uh, really pretty much the same, but in AD 321, he made Christian, Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And uh, that signaled an end of the persecution for quote-unquote Christians. By the way, may I just say Catholic Christians, because Constantine was the founder really of the Catholic Church, and a lot of these church fathers that we speak of are really Catholics, not church fathers, and we can go a lot into that, but Catholic Christians, not Bible-believing Christians, and it marked a beginning to the discrimination and persecution of the Jewish people. Imperial Rome in AD 313 issued the Edict of Milan, which granted favor to Christianity while outlawing synagogues. In AD 315, another edict allowed the burning of Jews if they were convicted of breaking the laws. And as we get in this, you're going to start noticing a deteriorating relationship between quote-unquote Christians. I would say most of them are not even Christians, but they uh, go under the banner of Christianity. Uh, Catholic, Catholic Christianity began to persecute Jewish people very heavily. Uh, the ancient privileges granted to the Jews were withdrawn. Uh, the uh, rabbinical jurisdiction was abolished or severely curtailed. Pros uh, the, the Jewish outreach was prohibited and made punishable by death. Jews were excluded from holding high office or having a military career. And once again, when we listen to some of the early quote-unquote church fathers who wrote about the Jewish people, and I just want to say another, by the way, by the way, I'm so glad that we follow the Bible, not the early church fathers. Amen. When somebody quotes those early church fathers and says, I believe like the early church fathers, well, let's uh, just go back to the Bible. Uh, let's just simply be Bible believers. And so often we get carried away with some early traditional church father who's normally Catholic right there, and we follow a Catholic rather than the Bible. I say we stick to the book. Uh, we look at some of these guys. Hillary of Potiers uh, wrote, Jews are a perverse people accursed, as, accursed by God forever. Gregory of Nyssa, A.D. 394, the bishop of Cappadocia, the Jews are abroad of vipers, haters of goodness. St. Jerome uh, said this. He described Jews as serpents wearing the image of Judas. Their psalms and prayers are braying of donkeys. And as you go in this, at the end of the 14th century, the bishop Antioch, John Christensen, uh, he said the synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and a lodging for wild beasts. No Jew adores God. Jews are uh, inver inveterate murderers possessed by the devil. Their debauchery and drunkenness gives them the manners of a pig. They kill and maim one another. By the way, part truth but obviously not all true. Listen to what else he said. He said this, he said, I have said enough against those who say that they are on our side, but are eager to follow the Jewish rites. It is against the Jews that I wish to draw up my battle. Then listen, he said, Jews are abandoned by God. And for the crime of deicide, there is no expiation possible. He was saying at that point, it's impossible for a Jew to, to get saved. It's impossible for a Jew to have a relationship with God. He was trying to say that it's impossible. By the way, he's not God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And there's hope for a Jew through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so when somebody begins to say it's not possible for somebody to get saved, I want to take into the book, the Bible. Uh, God is a merciful God, a loving God, and he cares for the Jewish people as he cares for anybody else. The air of replacement theology is like a cancer in the church. It, it's, um, it's a cancer that is not only caused, uh, it, it's cause of violating Scripture, violating the Word of God, uh, but it has made Christians instruments of hate and not of love. 
You do understand that? The replacement of theology eventually leads Christians or quote-unquote Christians to hate rather than to have the love of God. When we go down through the channels of time, we get to a man named Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a priest in the Catholic Church. He was brought up, taught, taught, taught replacement theology. He expounded replacement theology. He eventually got out of the Catholic Church, started Lutheranism, and Luther's attitude toward the Jews took different forms during his lifetime. In his early period, or until 1537, or not much earlier, he wanted to convert the Jews to Christianity, but he failed. He tried to reach them with uh, giving a little bit of honey, you might say. Uh, but he found that a lot of the Jews would not convert to Lutheranism, and it frustrated him. In the latter period, he wrote a book called, well, you can read it in German. There's a copy, uh, a copy of the title page but it's called The Jews and Their Lies. This is by Martin Luther, The Jews and Their Lies. He denounced the Jews and even urged their persecution. In the book, he argues, now listen to this. This is Martin Luther, the beloved, uh, one of the Reformation uh, people that people follow all over the world. In his book, he argues that Jewish synagogues and schools should be set on fire. He said their prayer books should be destroyed. Rabbis forbidden to preach. Their homes of Jewish people should be burned and property and money confiscated. They should be shown no mercy and no kindness. They should be afforded no legal protection. And these poisonous uh, uh, the worms, he called them, should be drafted into uh, forced labor or expelled for all time. He also seemed to advocate the murder of Jews when he said, we are at fault in not slaying them. Martin Luther. And, and this really encourages me want to become a Lutheran. So what's the big deal, Pastor? Here's the big deal. The slow evolving replacement theology can be very dangerous. By the way, it did, it did start out as evolving. Hey, uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they may be saved. And next thing you know, it leads to a little bit of tensions in the hundreds and two hundreds and three hundreds A.D. to all of a sudden outright hatred for the Jews. In the classic, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Arthur William Shire argued that Luther had basically drafted the blueprints for the Holocaust and concluded that his, quote, advice was literally followed. We go a little bit further. By the 1930s, at least, the Nazis were well aware of Luther's anti-Semitic work and used it to justify their actions. On the Jews and their lies, that book right there, was displayed prominently in a glass case during the Nuremberg rallies. And Nazi bigwigs regularly cited Luther as their kindred spirit. Quote, no judgment could be sharper, end, crew, end quote, Henrik Heimler said of Luther's writing against the Jews. These are prominent uh, Nazis. Uh, quote, unquote, with Luther, according to Hans Hinkel, the Reich's propaganda ministry, the, quote, the revolution of German blood and feeling against alien elements of the Volk was begun. Uh, Bishop Martin Sass, prominent in the pro-Nazi German Christian movement, published a collection of Jewish, uh, of Luther's anti-Semitic writings. He noted with satisfaction in the preface, this is uh, some uh, anti-Semitism writing. He said, on November 10th, 1938, on Luther's birthday, the synagogues are burning in Ger Germany. And he's proud of it. And calling Luther the greatest anti-Semite of his time. So what's the big deal? Why are we looking into the thought of replacement th theology? Does it matter? It mattered to, in Germany during World War II. It mattered to the 1 million to 6 million Jews that were killed during the Holocaust. It mattered to the families who, who fled the persecution, who lost everything. It mattered to the Jews who were put on the USS St. Louis. Do you remember that? The St. Louis was a German ocean liner filled with 900 Jews who, who came to enter the United States of America and were rejected. They went to Canada were rejected. They went to, uh, to Cuba and were rejected. The only place that accepted them was a few uh, countries in Europe over there, including Belgium. And it's said that over one uh, quarter of those people eventually died in the Holocaust, fires of the Holocaust right there. It mattered to them. By the way, the Nazi newspaper published 
Sir Julius Steinrich, who had received the first edition of On the Jews and Their Lies, this book from the people of Nuremberg as a birthday present, referred to that work in his own defense while on trial in the Nuremberg. Uh, he quote have said, Dr. Martin Luther would probably sit in my place in the defendant's dock today if this book had been taken into consideration by the prosecution. In other words, after World War II, the Nuremberg trials, he's on trial for the atrocities that had happened in the Holocaust right there. He said, if you think I'm bad, why, why don't you say something bad about Martin Luther? He said he would have been sitting here too. He would have uh, been excited about the persecution against the Jewish people. People defend Luther, by the way, saying his prejudice against the Jews was theological. And let's just call it bad theology. Amen. Amen. Replacement theology is bad theology. That's where we started today. And replacement, that's sort of a history of it. Number two, replacement theology, by the way, once again, is prominent in many Christian circles today. So what's the big deal? Why does it even matter? It's a big deal in your interpretation of Bible prophecy. That's where we're at at Daniel here. It's a big deal in your interpretation of Bible prophecy. Remember, Bible prophecy is simply history written in advance. Remember, Bible prophecy is from God through man. Remember, Bible prophecy gives us an expected end. We can know the future. Daniel, by the way, when we go back to these verses here in Daniel chapter 9, and we begin to read them again, look at with me at verse number 24, and you'll see this very quickly. You'll see 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And this is interesting, 70 weeks, 490 years, 69 weeks or the 483 years have already been fulfilled. Remember from the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the coming Messiah, it's going to be 69 weeks or 483 years. Boy, it happened exactly like God said. And then uh, we are living now in the 2000 year or more time of the Gentiles. And we're getting near, somewhere near to the last week of that prophecy, the 70th week, the last seven years that God has a plan for his people, his city, thy people, thy holy city. And when we begin to see that in light of the future Bible prophecy that that 70th week of Daniel is for his people, the Israelites, the Jewish people, the holy city there in Jerusalem, we see that replacement theology affects that. Okay, so look at what's happening today. May the 14th, 1948, Israel becomes a nation. Praise God. Uh, 1967, Jerusalem is taken by Israel in the Six-Day War. Glorious victory, miracle of God. Uh, 2017, the United States uh, declares Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. We rejoice in that. Does, does these events, do these events have anything to do with Bible prophecy? It doesn't if you believe in replacement theology. It doesn't if you believe in replacement. All of this is just a coincidence and propaganda, propaganda from the hated lying Jews. But to a Christian who simply believes the book, this is very exciting stuff. It's exciting. It seems like the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. Turn over there with me again to Ezekiel chapter 37. And really remember as we're turning there, replacement theology, it's a big deal in your interpretation of Bible prophecy. Somebody who just simply believes the Bible will be looking for the regathering of God's people, the children of Israel, back in the promised land, getting ready for this last 70th week of Daniel. And we can sort of see that on the high rise and we say, glory be to God. Uh, somebody who believes in replacement theology where they say the church replaced Israel, they all of a sudden say, ah, it's no big deal. It's just a coincidence. It has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. They lose their excitement. They lose the fulfillment of a lot of security we find in the Bible, a lot of the joy we have in the Bible. They're missing a glorious uh, part of the scriptures. Look in Ezekiel chapter 37. We're going to look at a, a nice little portion of this, but look at verse number one. And I'm going to look at this. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the, the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Verse three, can these bones live? Verse four, he said, prophesy upon these bones. O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
Verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall, ye shall live. Ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, it's interesting, these bones... And it describes this. These bones are dead, dry bones, but God's going to put breath back in these bones. First of all, he's going to put those bones back together. He's going to put flesh on those bones, sinews on those bones, and eventually God's going to breathe life into those bones. So verse 7, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a, a noise and a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. And by the way, no breath in them. Uh, no breath in them. The, the bones came together. Before the bones had life, the bones came together. The flesh came on them, the sinews, but they didn't have life. There was no life in them. And let me just reference and get ahead of myself a little bit. The, the, the nation of Israel has no life yet. They're not serving the Almighty God yet. And somebody say, well, obviously this can't be a fulfilling prophecy because they're not serving the Almighty God yet. They're right that they're not serving God yet. But they're like these dry bones that are coming back together. The flesh is beginning to cover those bones. The sinews are beginning to cover those bones. And God is going to breathe life into those bones. There is a day when Israel will bow down and worship the one and true God. It's going to happen. And we're seeing the film. Look at this, verse number nine. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the what? Whole house of Israel. These bones are the house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off for our parts. By the way, wow! Do you understand? Their bones were cut off. They were dry. They were dead. Yes, there is no hope. They say that. But there's hope with God. Amen. There is hope with God. In verse 12, it says, Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, O my people, those are the children of Israel, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Wow! That is exciting. Those bones can live. And we're seeing that God is bringing them up out of their graves. He's bringing them up into the land of Israel. He's putting those bones back together. A dead nation is coming to life again. And we're in the midst of full uh, Bible prophecy. And I would really like to read and continue on. Look, look at the verse 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, uh, his companions. And take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Verse 21, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. That's what's been happening the last hundred years. It's been a miracle. They've been coming out of all the heathen land and going back to their own land right there. 1948, they were declared a country again. Those bones are beginning to come back together. Oh, and eventually you get to verse number 22. And it says, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all, neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols. And by the way, it's going to happen, I don't think in the new, too distant future, where Jesus is going to come for his own. We're going to go up and be with the Lord. And then that 70th week of Daniel will begin. Glory. And at the end of that 70th week of Daniel, we're going to come with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to put his feet on old uh, Mount, the Mount of Olives. And with his mouth, he's going to destroy the, uh, the Satan and his Antichrist and all those evil followers that are with him right there. And then he's going to start the millennial reign of Christ. And that nation at that time is going to rule. And those bones will live right then. There's going to be life in those bones and praise God that's the fulfillment of Bible prophecy right there Amen. so back to where we start by the way are we there yet no 
Have those bones and sinews received life? No, but we can see it happening before our eyes, and it is exciting. The bones have come out of the grave, and the flesh is beginning to be put on the bones, and it won't be long now, and the Lord will breathe life back in those bones. That's why we get so excited when the United States says Jerusalem is the capital. Because we're seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled in our eyes. It helps us to love the Scriptures, believe the Scriptures, follow the Scriptures, say amen to the Scriptures. Oh, so back to where we started. Is modern-day Israel a beginning of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, or is it not? Replacement theology says no, no, no. The Bible says yes, yes, yes. Amen. It's very obvious right there. Replacement theology is bad theology because it does not rightly divide the Word of God. Amen. Now, this is the last point right there. It's going to go a little bit more detail in this, but replacement theology makes no sense. But it doesn't make any sense. Israel in the New Testament is the church, is what they say. The church has, has replaced the Old Testament Israel, they say. I'm going to say those statements again. They'll say, uh, Israel in the New Testament is the church. The church has replaced the Old Testament Israel. Really? Are you, are you sure? Let, let's look at the Bible. Go, go over with me to Romans chapter 10. Really? Are you sure? Let us uh, look at a couple places in the New Testament to test this theory. Let's try this verse right here. Let us replace the word Israel with the church and see if it even fits. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for, for the church is that they might be saved. But it doesn't make any sense. And by the way, that's after Acts chapter 2. He had a longing for the people of Israel. Paul is acknowledging that the Jewish people are real people. The church never replaced Israel. Go over to Romans chapter 11. This was your homework to read Romans chapter 11. And Paul answers this. I say then, verse number one, hath God cast away his people? Replacement theology will say, yes, he has. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Look, look at this. Go a little bit further in chapter 11, verse 25. And you've got to pay attention to this. This is amazing. Verse number 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel should be saved. But stop right there. Blindness part. He's saying as a general reality, Israel has been blind. They didn't recognize Jesus as being the Messiah, generally speaking. So saying, yeah, they've been blind. They're going to be blind until the fullness of the Gentiles, this time of the Gentiles. We've been living in the time of the Gentiles. God's blessing on the church, amen, is come. And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. And what he's saying right there is there's going to be coming the Messiah when he comes back, and all of Israel shall be saved. He's going to deliver them, set them up. And it's not necessarily talking about salvation, but he's going to save them from the last persecution, those last days at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. And there's going to be a lot of Jewish people that turn to the Messiah and proclaim him to be the king. And it's, it's amazing right there. God is not done with his people. Right. Replacement theology is not good theology. One more in Revelation chapter 7. Well, pastor, the church has replaced Israel. No, they hasn't. What about the 144,000 in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nassus were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simeon were twelve, sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. God's not done with Israel. Right. 
replacement theology is bad theology. So what should we do? So what should we do? Here's the end of the sermon. What should we do? Don't be deceived by those who teach replacement theology. Amen. Don't be deceived. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. It is Catholic doctrine. It came from the Catholics, the church fathers, the Catholics. It's bad theology. We don't get our Catholic the we don't get theology from the Catholics. We get our, our theology from the Bible, what we believe from the Bible. Amen. Number two, be excited. Be excited to know that today's Israel is the beginning of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Amen. When you begin to look all around you and all that's happening, these wars, these rumors of wars, and you see Israel, and they're in the midst of all this and an antagonist countries around them and problems and Oh, what it should do is it ought to get you to believe the book more. It was told about uh, thousands of years ago. And God's given us that to encourage us, to help us, and be excited to know that today's Israel is the beginning of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And then this, try your best to give the gospel to the Jews. They need to be saved. They still get saved the same way through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. My insurance agent is a Jew. By the way, he's a Christian Jew. He has trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. We've talked about it. And he has a broken heart about his Jewish parents who've not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we ought to try our best when we see Jewish people to give them the good news that Jesus is the Savior, the only hope for heaven. Replacement theology? It's bad theology. Let's pray.